Father, we are so grateful for every Lord's Day that we get to sing your praises. We get to celebrate on this, the first morning of the week, the very morning that you rose from the grave and put death to death. We have hope because of you, and we anticipate resurrection life um, with physical bodies in the future. We experience resurrection life in the spirit even now. We, we pray that our worship this morning would be pleasing to you, both our worship as we sing, our worship as we encourage, our worship as we minister one to another, and our worship as we hear your word with faith. As we have seen already in this service, Lord, you destroyed those who did not believe. You destroyed those who did not have faith. And we will see that again in the Gospel of Mark. And so I pray that as we look to your word, I beg that you would not let this moment be wasted, that it would be that it would not be a, a hearing of the word devoid of doing, but that it would be a hearing of the word joined with faith so that it would profit us who hear. Or does a very real threat before we comfortably sit down in our seats and grab a familiar copy of the scriptures and continue on with a familiar routine, there's a, there's a very real threat to think that just by virtue of being here, we would receive grace. Or grace only comes by means of faith. There's a very real threat that we would hear a familiar message and a familiar truth, and that we would just be glad to have been here. Do not let our hearts rest until they rest in you. Do not let the hearing of this message Stop reverberating in our conscience until we believe it, embrace it by faith, and, and have repented. And so, Lord, as we look to your word, we do pray that you'd grant faith, that you would sustain faith, that you would increase faith. And so, here we are, Lord, we, we believe but help our unbelief. In your name we pray, amen. All right, please grab a seat. And grab your Bibles as well. Grab your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 1. As you're turning there to uh, Mark chapter 1, um, I will say it's uh, sweet to bring a little report, a good report from camp. Uh, I got to be at camp for, uh, well, for Friday morning, really. Um, Dave, I saw Dave earlier. Where'd Dave go? Dave, uh, Dave and I were, were helping out with the dirty games and... Um, um, we were we were the horses at the jousting tournament. So I told the uh, I told the the parents in the in the equipping hour, if your kid comes home from youth camp and they complain about the horse beginning the the, the, the jousting tournament, I don't want to I don't want to have any responsibility. Um, I was I was I was struggling for a few rounds there. You know, it's like you get a you get a, like a junior high girl and I almost dumped her off, and then I get like a senior boy and I'm like about to you know get have, I got a hernia trying to get him up the hill and. So we, you know, we had this little uh, jousting tournament set up, and then they, they, they run by each other on these carts. Well, we pull them by each other on these carts, and then they squirt each other with squirters with paint. And uh, so it was, a pretty, it was a pretty fun game. And uh, there was fortunately a point against shooting the other knight's horse, so I only got killed three times, so I was very grateful for that. But um, it was just sweet to see everybody at camp. Um, it was very sweet to see, uh, you know, Josh has given phenomenal leadership to that uh, ministry, and Smed preaching 2 uh, Corinthians 5, and so even this morning, thinking about the fact they got to hear 2 Corinthians 5.21, and uh, we prayed for our students uh, this morning, we prayed for them at small group, I've been praying for them uh, on the drive up and the drive back, and so anyway, I just wanted to keep that in front of you, keep praying for our students, for our young people, to hear the truth with faith. And that's actually what we're talking about this morning, and the Gospel of Mark. So let's turn our attention back to Mark chapter 1. And I, I hate to do this to you. I want to do a quick recap. But what I'm, what I'm apologizing for is I just felt like there were some things that I edited out last time that I want to insert back in this time. So I'm going to do a little bit of going back to verses 12 and 13. But here's where we've been. If, you, if you've been with us, you remember that in chapter 
1 verse 1, Mark really gives us the title of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He proves that that's the, the proper thesis, and he proves that point with the quotation from the Old Testament involving three Old Testament passages. Um, and he gives us that quote in verses 2 and 3. And then in verses 4 through 8, is really the first narrative of this introduction. His, his introduction goes from verse 1 all the way through verse um, 15. From verse 1 to verse 15 is the introduction to the gospel as Mark writes it. And verses 4 through 8 start with the story of John the Baptist. He's the precursor. He's the forerunner. He's preparing the way. And how does he prepare the way? How do you possibly prepare the way for the Lord? The Lord God Almighty does not need any preparation. The people who are about to receive the Lord need preparation. The preparation for the way of the Lord is repentance. John preaches repentance. He ministers repentance. He's baptizing a baptism of repentance. And people are coming out to him into the wilderness to confess their sins and then lo and behold, verses 9 through 11, Jesus comes out in the midst of this massive um, journey out to the wilderness, the Jordan River Valley, and Jesus himself shows up to be baptized. And lest the reader think that, John, that, that um, Jesus is a sinner like the rest, there's this ominous silence about confession of sin that does not happen. And this man, Jesus from Nazareth, is baptized, and God opens up the heavens, sends down his spirit, who then takes up a residence in a formal fashion, not because Jesus was previously unspiritual, but because now he's anointed for his public ministry, and God speaks from heaven on high and says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. He's no sinner. This is God become man, and he's identifying with sinners. And then where we left off last time is in verses 12 and 13. And I wanted to just go back to this discussion where in verse 12 and 13, as soon as we see this man, Jesus, being declared God in no uncertain terms in verse 11, well, then God is sent out into the wilderness by the power of the Spirit like a man. He lives his earthly ministry completely reliant on the Holy Spirit. And so, as you see in verse 12, immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And um, a couple of details that I wanted to highlight before we quickly transition to our next two verses in verses 14 and 15. In verse, thir in verse 12, Mark uses a verb here, impelled. It's, it's really, it means cast out. It's the same verb that is used of many demons. Jesus casts out many demons. It's an authoritative motion. He is, Jesus is being cast out by the Holy Spirit, cast out into the wilderness. This is, there's authority here. Jesus brings his entire life under the authority of God's own spirit, and the spirit drives him out. It's a vivid word. It's bold it's stronger than even maybe Matthew's word, led. The Spirit led Jesus, which is also true. But Mark says the Spirit cast Jesus out into the wilderness. And uh, there's a really st a strong, a strength, authority here. And I was thinking about that dy dynamic, and I was thinking this is a remarkable picture for us of what it looks like for a man to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's a single parent in the room who doesn't pray and long for, the vision of a tangible display of what it would look like for the Holy Spirit to take up residence in their child's life. What would it look like for a child that I brought into the world and gave him my own sin nature? What would it look like for him to, well, for most of you, him or her, but for us, it's just him, him, and him, and him. What would it look like if the Holy Spirit took up residence in that soul and had control over the faculties with all of the person, uh, personal strengths and weaknesses and idiosyncrasies and character traits, but under the Spirit's influence, under the Spirit's control? What would it look like for a human being to be entirely under the Holy Spirit's control? Has that ever happened? Yes. Jesus Christ. He doesn't just identify with us because he just happened to take up a body and just kind of float through an otherwise ephemeral existence, walking on water, as it were, of his deity, appealing to divine 
prerogative to avoid the real full experience of humanity. He actually experienced every human temptation, every human limitation, human weakness. He experienced it all and he relied entirely on the Spirit and was perfect. And so, we also briefly saw in verse 13, he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Of course, the other authors mentioned the, the temptations as we talked about. And the other, uh, the synoptic writers also mentioned the fasting, that he went um, 40 days um, without food or drink, and the angels are ministering to them, which is common to all of the gospel writers, all the synoptic writers at least. It's no surprise that Moses on Mount Sinai went 40 days without food or drink. It says he was 40 days on the mountain in Exodus 24, 18. And then when he's preaching about it to the nation, uh, years, 40 years later in Deuteronomy 9, verse 9, he even adds that element and recognizes that he was without food or drink. Elijah, also on Horeb, was fed once and then went in the strength and the power of that food for 40 days and 40 nights on Sinai, uh, Mount Horeb, as it's called in 1 Kings 19, verse 8 and 19, verse 15. And both of these major prototypical prophets go 40 days without food and drink out in the wilderness hearing from God before God reveals himself in a marvelous way. Of course, this is no different. But one thing I skipped that I wanted to just go back and pick up is that notion of verse 12, the wild beasts. He's out in the wilderness. Why is it even a wilderness? This is a land flowing with fruits, with fruit and honey and milk and honey, and it was luxurious, it was verdant, it was green, it produced, it was desirable. And you, you read the description of the nation of Israel in the Torah before Israel gets there, and it sounds like it's describing something totally unrecognizable from what any of you have experienced if you visited. I mean, they've got two things, rocks and tourism. That's it. What happened? The unbelief of the nation. The unbelief of the nation. Why is there a wilderness? Because the conditions of the covenant have not yet been met. Why is there a wilderness? Because of unbelief, lack of repentance. Jesus goes out into the wilderness, and he's out there being tempted by Satan, who rules this world, because this world has been cursed, and it's been subjugated to the rule of the prince of the power of the air ever since Genesis 3.15. Here is Jesus, the God-man, in the domain of Satan, successful because he's relying on the Holy Spirit. And then why the wild beasts? Because the wild beasts are a sign of the curse. Keep your finger in Mark 1 and flip over to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, and I'm going to show this to you. In Deuteronomy 32, it describes what's going to happen if the conditions of the covenant are not met. It's going to describe... Um, what the Lord will do. In verse 23, I will heap mis misfortunes on them. I will use my arrows on them. Verse 24, they will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction and the teeth of beasts I will send upon them with the venom of crawling things of the dust. What an incredible, incredible curse. Uh, famine, Yep, check. Bitter destruction, teeth of beasts, wild animals um, walking all over the promised land. That's another sign of the curse. God even says in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, don't turn there, but he even says in chapter 7 that he's going to um, alleviate the wild beasts in a slower fashion so that, they, the, the, so that they can actually take up occupation, take up residency, so that it doesn't happen too quickly. But nevertheless, that's still a sign of the of the curse. And interestingly, if you contrast that with the promise of what it's going to be like when the conditions of the covenant are fulfilled under the reign of the future son of David, listen to Isaiah chapter 35, verse 9. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 34, also a new covenant promise. And here he's describing, once again, what's going to happen when 
when Yahweh is reigning as the shepherd over Israel, in verses 23 to 28, Ezekiel writes this, Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. And of course, if you're, if you're not familiar with Ezekiel, Ezekiel's writing many, many years after David, centuries after David. I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them in the places around my hill a blessing. I will cause showers to come down on their season, and they will be showers of blessing. Also, the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be in... They will be secure on their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who have enslaved them. They will no longer be a prey to the nations, and the beasts of the earth will not devour them, but they will live securely, and no one will make them afraid. When you look at what happens to our Lord in this in these two verses, in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he goes out into the wilderness and he's experiencing the effects of the curse. Do not imagine for a moment that Jesus can't identify with us. I mean, think about the potential thoughts that could rise up in, as a complaint in your heart. Let me just personify, not in some sort of weird, twisted way of like trying to put myself in Jesus' shoes, which would be blasphemous. But let me just personify the temptations that I can even quickly imagine. If I created these people, created this land the way it's supposed to be, then these people just messed it up. And now I had to become a human? The sinful, uh, not a sinful soul, but it was a sin-afflicted body. He had the likeness of sinful flesh, though he never sinned. He experienced the weakness of true humanity under the curse. Under in the world where Satan ruled, in the wilderness, with the wild beasts, experiencing the weakness of lack of, dr of drink, lack of food. Do I really have to do this? I mean, you think about just the very real, raw humanity of Jesus Christ, and it should cause us to stagger in the gospel of the theme, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so we have no grounds to complain whenever we suffer, whenever we struggle, whenever we're tempted, whenever we feel limitation, to imagine that God cannot identify with us because Jesus certainly can. Well, I want to quickly turn to our last narrative in this introduction. It's chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. And here... Mark concludes the introduction to this gospel with these words. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is profound. Mark concludes his introduction by making gospel bookends, literally gospel bookends. If you go back to verse 1, remember the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now in verse 14, it's the gospel of God. And in verse 15, believe in the gospel. Verse 1, verse 14, verse 15, all explicitly talking about the gospel. This is the bookend that he puts together around his entire introduction. A lot of commentators like to take the introduction as verses 1 through 13. Um, uh, but the, the problem there is that it ruins the gospel bookends, and then it also kind of, um, some, some even go all the way to verse 20, but that ruins the bookends of the first section, which properly starts with the disciples, verses 16 to 20, and then it ends with the disciples, chapter 8, verses 17 to 21, uh, which we'll get to in a few short weeks, I'm sure. But nevertheless, the bookends are there, and it's very consistent, and so I'm taking my cues from Mark. What's important about that, though, is knowing that this is here on purpose, it's important to understand how Mark tells his story so that we can appreciate from the gospel and get out of it what we need to get out of it. We talked about this early on in the introduction to Mark. Mark's a phenomenal storyteller. 
I mean, this guy is just amazing. He has an incredible ability to tell a story. Uh, the details that he includes through Peter's eyewitness account are, are, uh, stand out even above his, his uh, peers, um, Matthew and Luke and John. And there's, there's the way that he tells a story by way of thematic refrains and the bookends and all that he does in his gospel is just profound. However, Mark's storytelling capabilities never get in the way of his content. It's interesting, this, kind of, this, this can often happen, you know, you hear a storyteller who's just really good, and you say, wow, that guy was just smooth, and I've even heard that in sermons at times, where you're, you're hanging on the edge of your seat, and you're in the sermon, and then it's like, like this, is, this is amazing, and then you get to the end of it, and you're like, what, what was it? It's exhilarating. It's like cotton candy. It tasted really good going down, and then you're left with nothing. <laughs> I remember watching a watching a movie recently on, uh, well, that was a few years ago, I think, but it was a World War II movie on a particular battle uh, in, from World War II, and it was interesting how the story was told. I mean, the, the, the storytelling um, device got a lot of commentary from critics, and basically the story took three separate storylines, and one was told over the plot line of about a week, this, the other was told over the plot line of about a day, and then the last one was told over the, uh, over the, the course of one hour. And all three stories are told uh, interchangeably. So you, you're, tra- you're, you're going back and forth within all three storylines, and they don't tell you that you're, they're doing that to you when you start the movie. I remember watching the movie and finishing the movie and sitting there thinking, and I'm not like a, a World War II buff, but I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable about World War II. And I just sat there, I had scratching my head. There's so many unanswered questions. This actually raised more questions than it answered. And I remember kind of being frustrated. And re- then I started reading the reviews and I started realizing it was kind of like an experiment in storytelling. And that particular story, I believe to this day, probably is more known for how the story was told than the content of the story. The storytelling took over and stole the show. It was more memorable than the storyline itself. Mark never falls into that problem. When Mark tells the story, the way he tells the story, the details he includes, why it's where it's positioned in the gospel. Because remember, it's not chronological. He is setting up a framework. He's setting up an experience. He's bringing the reader to an inspired perspective that he wants us to have. And that's no different with this story. He ends his introduction with the gospel and preaching of repentance. He began the introduction with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the forerunner, preaching repentance. The introduction begins and ends with the gospel. It begins and ends with repentance. That is not coincidental. This is the perspective we must have to understand Mark's gospel. We live in an age of gospel-centeredness, and the question becomes, which gospel? Gospel simply means good news. It's a good message. Good news, good tidings. Rejoice, we've got some good news. Finally, good news. We need good news. Well, what's the news? There's a thousand different good tidings. Paul, you remember, we did this back in December, I believe. We were in Galatians chapter 1. He says, if anyone preaches to you anything other than the gospel which I received from the Lord, let him be accursed. Because they're preaching another gospel, which is not another of the same kind. It's a different gospel. There's only one true gospel. So let's just even narrow it to the true gospel. What's the moniker on the true gospel? And when you read the scriptures and among uh, true believers, there's a lot of different phrases that go there, aren't there? The gospel of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of peace. What's the gospel here? It should knock us out of our seat. The gospel of God. The gospel of God. This is profound. The gospel of God. What's the good news? God. 
He's the content of the gospel. Some, some might take it as the, you know, got a source here. It's, it's the gospel that comes from God, which is also true. But that would be true of the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of peace, the gospel of Christ. Those are all from God. What's interesting about this is in the context, it seems pretty clear. It's a little bit debatable, but it's, I, I think we can make a pretty strong case for the fact that in light of the quote from Exodus, Isaiah, and Malachi at the beginning of the gospel, this is the good news of God. Good news! God is here! Remember Isaiah 40? Behold your God. That's the message that the forerunner is supposed to preach. John the Baptist shows up and says, good news, the one coming after me is stronger than me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Jesus shows up and says, good news, the gospel of God. It's like John the Baptist is saying God's coming and Jesus comes along and says, I'm here. Jesus preaches a gospel that says, good news, I'm here. You expected God to come and here I am. I mean, if you, you, don't, you don't want to miss that phrase right there in verse 14. He's preaching the gospel of God. And in the context, that is in no uncertain way, a claim of deity. Jesus Christ is coming and says, I'm here. And that's the true of every preacher. John the Baptist, the one who's coming is God. Jesus, I'm God. Every faithful apostle, he was God. Every faithful preacher since the apostolic era, he was God. And still is. So let's look at verse 14, and we're going to learn what we need to learn about this gospel of God. Verse 14 starts out, after John has been taken into custody. Hmm. Now, we haven't even finished the introduction, and we've already got a statement about John. Several of you have been asking me about John. Well, what about John? I mean, you've been talking about John, and you haven't answered the question, is John Elijah? And I, I know, I'm keeping, you in, I'm keeping you in attention. There's a little bit of suspense there. We're, 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 he gets cu- his head cut off in chapter 6, and Elijah comes back up in discussion in, in chapter 9 for good reason. And so we're going to get there. We're going to answer all those questions, I, I hope. Uh, you can still ask questions if I don't answer them. But I, I deliberately haven't been talking about it. But in verse 14, it's already interesting, and it's already suspicious that in light of the expectation from Malachi's prophecy, which we've already cro- quoted from and studied, In Malachi chapter 3, the Lord's coming in the temple. And before the Lord comes, chapter 4 says, before the Lord shows up on earth, John the Baptist is going to show up. I'm sorry, he says, uh, Elijah's going to show up, and he's going to turn hearts back to the people. Hearts of fathers are going to be restored to sons, and sons back to fathers, and there's going to be a national revival, and uh, the family order is restored, and the covenant is being obeyed, and that's going to be a mark of the Lord showing up on earth. And so then the question becomes, well, what about John the Baptist? Is he that Elijah of chapter 4? Well, he's already thrown in prison. Things aren't looking so good. Our hearts being turned back. You say, well, there was a lot of people who went out to get baptized. That's true. There were a lot of individuals who were baptized. There were some legitimate, genuine believers Several hundred, according to 1 Corinthians 15, who talk about the resurrected uh, Christ being eyewitnessed by, by several hundred in Jerusalem. They believed the gospel. They repented at John's preaching. They repented at Jesus' preaching. But not like Malachi 4. Not nationwide. John's in custody. And this becomes the lot of everyone in this book who preaches repentance. John preaches repentance. He's thrown in custody. Jesus sends out the 12 to preach repentance in chapter 6. While they're out preaching repentance, excited about their newfound authority, John's in prison and he gets his head cut off. Jesus is trying to teach them a lesson. This is what happens when you preach repentance. Jesus preaches repentance and he gets hung on a cross. And the question's going to be for the disciples, are you going to preach repentance? This is an unpopular message. It's always been unpopular. It was unpopular in John's day, Jesus' day, the disciples' day, and, of course, our day. We'll get to that in just a second, but let's look at what Mark's doing here. After John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. I mean, he's, he's going into the northern area of Israel. This is like the backwoods if you lived in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the happening uh, you know, center, the urban center, and um, Galilee's where everybody has an accent, everybody speaks different up there. This is just the backwoods. 
And Jesus goes up there and starts preaching the gospel. Not just any gospel, as I mentioned, he's preaching the gospel of God. And now, notice what the content is. This is Mark's summary of Jesus' preaching ministry. And this summary takes all of one verse. Look at verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, I know I'm only preaching two verses, but I actually have two outlines for you. I had to come up with two outlines because verse 15 has two statements and then two commands. And so the, the two statements, they're just statements of fact. He's just describing what we need to know as we think about the gospel of God. And so first thing you'll see here, I got, I got on the PowerPoint for you. The gospel of God means, what does it mean? This is like, these statements of fact describe the gospel of God. The first statement is in verse 15a, the time is fulfilled. The time has been fulfilled. This is talking about the fulfillment of the age of promise. God has been promising a solution to the sin problem ever since Genesis 3.15. He's been promising an individual born of man ever since the the promise given to Eve in Genesis 3.15. He's been promising a divine individual ever since Exodus 3 and Exodus 6 when the divine angel of the Lord says, I'll be the one. And he starts to redeem his people to get them to the promised land and protect them to get them there. And they converge in the seed line all the way down through David. And then the prophet Isaiah says he's going to be a ruler and he's going to, be, uh, he's going to uh, uh, reverse the curse and he's going to establish peace and harmony and every effect of the curse that you can know, this one's going to reverse it and establish uh, dominion and give all glory to God. And no one in that day will steal glory from man. It will all go to the Lord. All of this is pointing toward this moment. Jesus comes to earth. He's pre-existent. He just adds humanity and shows up with a human voice to be able to say, the time has been fulfilled. This is profound. Think about how many countless saints long to see this day. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 for a second. 1 Peter describes that reality that these Old Testament authors, Old Testament saints, the prophets, and the authors and those who read it would have longed to see the day of Christ. Verse 10, as to this, uh, sorry, 1 Peter 1.10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I mean, this is a profound, profound verse. Old Testament authors writing inspired prophecies, and they're looking at it, and they know the meaning of the prophecy. It's clear. It's not ambiguous. It's, it's so clear. They know this is the Spirit of Christ. He's going to suffer. He knows, they know there's going to be glories that follow. They know that this is for a future generation. They know all of that right there. This verse says they know all of that. What they didn't know, who's the individual who will be the Christ? And what are the seasons that are going to mark that fulfillment? They knew Christ. They were waiting to learn Jesus. And so Jesus comes on the scene and says, I'm here. Times are fulfilled. That's a profound statement. No wonder Mark says he's preaching the gospel of God, the arrival of God on earth in human form. Times have been fulfilled. Secondly, notice this phrase, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of God is at hand, or has drawn near. The kingdom of God has drawn near. What is this talking about? Kingdom, it has to do with rulership. It has to do with a reign. The kingdom of God has drawn near. Obviously, it is not talking about God's sovereignty. God has always been and always will be sovereign. There is no such way that we could possibly say, he's almost sovereign. His sovereignty is about to be here. It's about to break through. 
He's always been sovereign. He always will be sovereign. For the kingdom of God to draw near means that the authority of God in heaven is about to be manifest on earth. It's drawn near. It's come close. It's almost here. Listen, from the Old Testament's perspective, it has always been anticipated that the Lord will reign forever and ever. As early as Exodus 15, verse 18, listen to this. In the, in the Song of Moses, he writes, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. In 1 Samuel, listen to this. Don't, don't turn here. I'm going to do a little bit of jumping around here for a second. 1 Samuel, do you remember when Samuel was leading the people? The people saw the nations with the king, and they wanted a, nation, uh, they wanted a king like the, the pagan nations. Well, listen to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. God has always been the king. Then you get to chapter 12, verse 12. It says, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord your God was your king. Samuel's reminding the people, God was your king, and you didn't want that. The generation under Samuel was rejecting God as their king. In Psalm 146, verse 10, the Lord reigns forever. I mean, the reign of the Lord, especially the reign of the Lord coming to earth, has been the anticipation of the Old Testament promise. However, here's the, here's the thread of Old Testament promise that's particularly important for understanding Jesus' statement here. In the Old Testament, it's very clear that this rule of God is going to be mediated on earth through a human seed. We've already talked about that in Genesis and Exodus, so let's pick up that, that thread later in the story, which we did, have never gotten time for, which is back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, and this is where you might want to turn and look, because we're going to look at this, this brief paragraph here. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is the Davidic covenant, and he talks about David's past realities. He talks about future promises that are going to be fulfilled um, during David's lifetime. Then he talks about future uh, realities after David's lifetime, and it's the ones after David's lifetime that are particularly important for us. So let's pick it up in verse 11b. 2 Samuel 7, verse 11b. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant, that's singular, I will raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And that's a promise. There is going to be a seed of David who's going to rule forever. And that's talking about a human king. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Welcome to Mark, the gospel of the son of God. However, this is where people get confused. Verse 14, when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. What's that have to do with anything? Well, because there's a lot of generations of sinful seeds from the line of David before you get to Jesus. He's the only one who qualifies. Verse 15, but my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul when I removed it from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. At this point, I would love to just buy a time expander and just take the time to read Psalm 2 and read Psalm 89 and, and read Micah 4 verses 6 and 7, but I'll let you do that on your own. This promise of a of a, a, a divine rule mediated through a human king is all over the Old Testament. Here in Mark chapter 1, Jesus says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. He does not say that the kingdom of God has arrived. He does not say that the kingdom of God has been established. He says it's near, it's drawn near, it's coming close. What's it take to have a a rule. Well, there's at least three things. A ruler, a realm, and the right. That's an easy way to remember it. Ruler, realm, and a right. You got to have a king, you got to have a, a people, and you got to have authority. The right to rule 
Jesus is the king, and he's arrived. And he has the authority, but the realm, the response of the people, that's hanging in the balance. What's going to make the difference? Well, I'll just put it all on the table. It's the last half of the verse 15. The command is repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. You do understand, don't you, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of the living God. You do understand he has all authority. He has the right to rule, and he is the king. You do understand that if he wanted to, he could have established his kingdom on his first coming. And the kingdom would have been empty, apart from repentance and faith. You see what Jesus does here is he has, Mark summarizes his preaching with two, two statements of fact. The time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what the gospel of God means. It means the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is really close. That's what the gospel of God means. And the implication, what's required, are the imperatives. These are commands. These are obligations. These have to happen. You must repent and believe in the gospel. He summarizes Jesus' preaching with two imperatives. Repent and believe. That change from two statements of fact to two commands is really why I gave you two different outlines. The good news about God requires repentance and faith. And here's where we got to spend our last few minutes. Repentance. You know what this means? We talked about this at the beginning of Mark's gospel. It means a change of mind, a radical change of mind. The Hebrew word for repentance means to turn. It's a turning, a change of mind, a change of soul, a change of not just behavior, as we talked about. There's, there's context where repentance can be used of behavior. Repent, repent from dead works, Hebrews 6.1 says, repentance from dead works. There's often times where repentance is used as distinct from the effect, like when John is preaching in Luke 3, and he says, repent and produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The fruit that's tangible, the lifestyle, flows out of a heart that's repentant. It's a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of soul. Repentance is what happens when a sinner who loves self begins loving God. A sinner who loves sin begins to hate sin. It's a radical change, a radical transformation. It starts in the heart, it starts in the mind. It's, it's an internal work, and it produces fruit. It produces a changed life. So we can rightly acknowledge that repentance is an internal issue. It's a heart issue before it's a behavioral issue. What's important to notice in this context is that repentance is commanded. It's an imperative. Listen, you might get accustomed to, maybe, maybe you come to this church um, uh, and, and, and you come here regularly and maybe you're not a believer and you appreciate even a, a caveat before communion, um, uh, this doesn't apply to me. Listen, I don't, I, don't, it, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're in Christ or you're out of Christ. This command applies to you. You are obligated by the authority of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You must repent. That is authoritative and binding on every single soul and conscience in this room. Repent and believe the gospel. It's commanded. It's required. It's necessary. It's obligatory. It's not optional. It's not something that characterizes super Christians. It's the reality of every Christian. If you have not repented, you are not his. If you do not, you don't possess the kingdom, you haven't been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son, and you will not enter the kingdom when it's manifested on earth. Well, apart from repentance, none of that applies to you. This message is an assault on the human pride, on the human ego. This is why this message is never popular. It wasn't popular in John's day. It's not popular now. Because it assaults man where we want pride the most, self-reliance. We, want, we desperately want something, something about us that's good, or at least something about us that's better than someone else. At least something about us that can put us in God's favor. Something innate to us that would put a bigger smile on God's face. And here comes the demand for repentance that says, nope. That does not exist. Repentance is the great equalizer. It neutralizes every 
every inclination of pride, every boast, every human reliance. Repentance, like regeneration, is a work of God. Repentance is is a work of God because Acts 5 says that God granted repentance to Israel. Acts 11, he granted repentance to the Gentiles also. Both are works of God. Both are supernaturally enabled, but there's a radical difference. Repent is active. The command to be born again is passive. Being born again is something that happens to you. You are actually responsible to repent. You ever thought about the awkwardness of a passive command? Grammarian, nerd grammarians like me think about that kind of stuff. If I told you, hey, give the person next to you five bucks, I mean, that makes perfect sense. You know exactly what to do. You might not have five bucks, but you know what that means. So try this one. Hey, right now, before the service is over, you must be given five bucks. You're like, well, that's a strange one. I must be given five bucks? What do I do there? Something must happen to me? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a passive command. Something must happen to you. Regeneration is a divine work of God, and you must be born again. It's necessary, it's obligatory, but you are passive. It's something that God does to you. Repentance is also just as obligatory as regeneration. It's necessary, but you're responsible to do it. You must repent. The active nature of this verb cuts through every excuse. In fact, in Reformed Christian circles, Unbelievers are prone to hide under the camouflage of election and predestination and sovereignty and say, well, if the Lord wants to save me, he can do whatever he wants. Well, no one's doubting the Lord can do whatever he wants. The question is, are you going to bow the knee and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and obey his command, which is repent? You must repent. This assaults the pride of every generation. I have a quote on the PowerPoint, but actually, I I, I realized I should have put this one on here as well. I I don't have this one on the PowerPoint, so you have to listen. Um, Ian Murray writes and quotes Lloyd-Jones at length on why the supernatural doctrines like regeneration and repentance are such an offense against man's pride. He he wrote, Dr. Lloyd-Jones believed that the real opposition to evangelical and supernatural religion came from the pride which resents what is implied in Christ's teaching that men must be, quote, born again. By telling people that you must be born again, you are simply telling them that as they are, they are all wrong and that nothing but a divine supernatural intervention from above can possibly save them and put them right. Come, let us be quite as honest with ourselves as each other. Why is it that we do not like all this talk about conversion and rebirth? And that's our two words, regeneration and and repentance. That's the two words he's talking about. Why indeed is it scarcely ever mentioned in our chapels and churches these days? Because it's an offense. It's not popular. This is a message, it's Jesus' message, and it doesn't flatter any sinner. Repent. The second command Believe. Just like repent, it's obligatory, and just like regeneration, it's obligatory, but unlike regeneration and also like repentance, faith is active. You must believe. Let's talk about faith for a moment. Faith, first of all, is not just knowledge. Sometimes we talk about you know, um, we can even use the word believe. Uh, James uses it this way. The demons believe that, um, uh, Jesus, that Jesus is God and that the Lord is God. And great, they believe and they shudder. There's knowledge there. Faith is way more than knowledge. You say, ah, the difference is between knowing it and agreeing with it. That's still not far enough for the biblical definition. Here's an example, Luke 6, 46. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? There is a belief on a human part that Jesus is Lord. 
They agree that he's Lord. They call him Lord. They say that he's Lord. They profess that he's Lord. There's no lack of agreement at all. The question is, why don't they do what he says? Faith is more than knowledge. It's more than agreement. It is entrustment. If you believe the gospel of God, you entrust your soul to God. You leave all of your eggs in one basket, and you rest yourself right there in the person and work of Christ. And you say, this is my only hope, and whatever he says, I do, and I want all glory to go to him, not to self. That is faith. Faith always takes God at his word. It always embraces his word. Think about this. What does faith and repentance look like if somebody lives, a sinner lives in a state of drunkenness? Well, then repentance means turning away from the alcohol and believing the promises of God, regarding all of the little subtle little lies, lies of escapism and loving how I feel. If a sinner lives immorally, then repentance means parting with fornication. If a sinner lies and deceives, then he must kill that sin by uncovering the deception and He must tenaciously commit to being a truth teller. But similarly, think about this. If a religious person, let's say a regular attender at GBC, makes a habit of attempting to practice repentance and to exercise faith in such a way that they believe that they're believing and they're repenting, earn them good standing with God or merit some favor with him. They must repent of their repentance. They must begin trusting the gospel of God, not my ability to repent and believe. You see the difference? The only way to repent from that sort of religious self-reliance is to not rely on self at all. I want to read you a a couple slides. It's a little bit of a longer quote, but I think it's worth it. It's on the PowerPoint. You can hopefully follow along. A Christian, this is Lloyd-Jones on faith, a Christian, a person who is saved, is one who believes and realizes that. That is how we become Christians. The Christian is one who, having realized this truth, does not attempt to do anything to save himself. If you try to do anything, it means you do not understand this. Of course, realizing this great truth, you will afterwards strive with all your might and main to please him and to do all you can. But that does not save you, and you do not rely upon that in your salvation. The man who believes this repents, but it is not his repentance that saves him. You are not saved because you repent. You are not saved because you believe the gospel, though both are involved in salvation. You are saved because God justifies you by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of God, by the way. We produce no works at all to earn our salvation. Faith is not a form of works. We have nothing whereof to boast, nothing whatsoever. It is entirely the action of God. A Christian is one who sees that and who rests upon it. Amen. A Christian looks at that and realizes, I need to repent of relying on self. I got to look outside myself. My only hope comes from God in Christ through his spirit. The gospel of God is you are saved by means of, by, because of the work of Christ, by means of faith and repentance. It's the means, not the cause. And that's why Jesus commands, repent and believe. I want to ask you, I wouldn't have preached this text yet. In fact, I might, you, might say, you might accurately say I haven't preached this text yet. Hopefully I've explained it. But I, I just can't help but appreciate we're in Mark. I take my cues from him. The bookends are repentance. The introduction starts and ends with Repentance. Repent and believe in the gospel of God. Do you call yourself a Christian? That's well and good, but that's not what Jesus calls for. 
have you repented and believed the gospel? What do I look for? You look for real change. If your heart is the most deceitful thing on the face of the planet, and it is, Jeremiah 17 says, you can deceive yourself. I can deceive myself. I dare not look within to analyze whether I have repented and believed. I need deliverance from my own subjectivity. I need to escape from my ability to deceive myself. I need something objective. Go to God's word. Start with Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Paul says to the Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Wait, that's a command for me to work out my salvation? Yep. Because God is at work within you. This is the gospel of God. He is at work within you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. If you are one sitting here and you've probably heard all of these truths before, but you look at your life and you say, I know it. I agree it. I, 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 not only do I agree with it, I think I, enjoy, I trust myself to it. The question then is not, do you will to do God's desire, but do you actually carry out the act of God's desire in your life? Not perfectly, but do you act out God's will in your life? If your life is not characterized by carrying out the will of God, you have not repented, and you must There's no other way to get into the kingdom than through faith and repentance. Father, we're so thankful for the clarity of your word, and this is so eminently an unpopular doctrine, and it got John killed, it got your son killed, and it's got thousands killed through the history of the church. Just pray that by your spirit, that you would give life through this message, that perhaps someone who maybe has a lot of religious knowledge and maybe even a lot of religious agreement, but perhaps no true entrustment to the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, perhaps their lack of power over sin, perhaps their lack of fruit, perhaps their perpetual anxiety, perhaps their habitual lying, perhaps their enslavement to lust, perhaps the fact that they can't shake selfish ambition, perhaps the fact that they've lived year after year after year of profession in love with self, never able truly to say no to the flesh in areas where only you and they might know. I pray that for that person, that they would be undone and that you would grant repentance. Lord, as we think about preparing for the book of Mark, what an incredible introduction. We, we should not be surprised at the brilliance of it because you wrote it, but how refreshing it is. We long for you to help us. We believe, but help our unbelief. Increase our faith, strengthen our faith so that we benefit from this sweet gospel. Lord, you deserve all worship. What we can give you on our own is is worthless. But what you produce through us as we obey your commands is glorious. So Lord, I just pray that you would continue that. And for every true believer, Lord, I pray that these, uh, these statements about the gospel of God and these two commands about the gospel of God would just be wind in our sails. Thank you so much for a clear word so that we can benefit from the gospel the way that we ought. In your name we pray, amen.